Okay. Why not? Okay, so welcome fabulous audience to the Robot Drive System Fundamentals um, here at the uh, Queen City First at the Cincinnati, Malls, uh, Cincinnati Mills Mall. Uh, my name is Dave Campbell. I've been a, an FRC mentor for 16 years um, and um, I'm currently the lead mentor for Team 144. Uh, I have worked with other teams in the past. Uh, so what I'm about to tell you is 98% uh, stolen and 2% uh, lies. So, um, so we'll start with the 98% the stolen. The acknowledgments, this is, this is, when you look up FRC drivetrains um, on the web, just through Google itself, you'll find some phenomenal resources from these fellas, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Paul Cop uh, Copioli and Ken Patton, they're mentors of the uh, Thunder Chicken and uh, Husky Brigade, Andy Baker, who's president of Andy Mark, uh, Ben Bennett from uh, Symbotics 1114, Travis Hoffman from Delphi Elite, and Neofra, and um, also uh, the Hot Dream team from uh, Hot Hashron Israel has some uh, information that I stole as well. So these, uh, these folks are the 98% that I stole of this drivetrain presentation. And the, uh, the Hot Dream video, is, it, you'll see, is excellent before we go on break. Uh, this is a two-hour session that I'm going to condense down into two different segments. Today we're going to cover, uh, cover the basics of first drivetrains. So I'll only spend uh, about 45 minutes or an hour on this section. Um, so we're going to, so um, I, I'm a fan of westerns, so I love the Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, um, of which all three characters were good, but The, the Good, um, I, I believe that this, this YouTube video put out from, uh, from a team that most people will recognize, um, this is Team seven, uh, 1717, and um, their drive system in uh, 2012 uh, was phenomenal, and the, just the fact that they were able to build Swerve Drive um, is amazing. They're able to pivot. The video itself is, uh, it goes through all the different iterations. They can swerve in any orientation and drive it away from the drivers and back to the drivers while controlling it the entire time, controlling that rotation. So in 2012, um, that was a very useful system uh, to have. Um, so y we could go through the iterations of that. They pivot around each wheel. Uh, which is a neat execution uh, if you're a, playing a point guard on a basketball team and you need to pivot around to make a shot if you have a fixed point so you'll see them rotate around each wheel. Uh, this is what I consider to be an incredible first drivetrain. Um, that they can just have that much finite control over it. That is a, a monumental task to be able to spend the time manufacturing that, um, manufacturing that drivetrain um, to be able to run um, to be able to run that software uh, that controls it. Um, an amazing link that I consider also to be uh, another amazing robot that is the Wildstang drivetrain uh, from 2004 where they had to climb a six inch uh, a six inch lip up and over and of course not everyone is perfect um, but uh, they they do have this drivetrain that that rocks it lifts to that six inch level and they can climb the uh, they can climb the uh, up to the six inch platform. So uh, it was a very, very, very useful drivetrain for them. Um, and so uh, more, more of Wildstang's previous robots. So I consider that to be an amazing drivetrain with just the, the ability to, um, to do that. And then I am a little bit biased with this last drivetrain um, through uh, a, uh, a fond fan of ours is a uh, Team 48, uh, actually their robot had a good strong drivetrain that year, but when it encountered a tube and 1038's robot, um, it just decided that it didn't want to stay on its vertical orientation. So uh, where a, a good drivetrain goes bad is when the drivetrain is standing up in the air like that, um, not in contact with the floor. And, and uh, this happened to be a practice round at the uh, Buckeye Regional, and 1038 went on to do a, a very competitive year that year at Buckeye. Um, and uh, when I say the bad in this next one, um, it's not because it was a bad drivetrain. Um, it was, uh, in some cases, these guys were bad. So when I look at the top link, um, this is a, from my, one of my favorite contest years. Um, but this was a, uh, down at the Epcot Center. Uh, this was the semifinals uh, on Einstein. Um, it was the Bionic Bulldogs, Team 60, along with Team 144. 
um, against the, the Beatty Beast and well in that case it didn't really matter who was with the Beatty Beast and you're about to see why. Um, this is one bad drivetrain. Uh, you'll see it, it's right there, upright. Um, but that year we had to carry around 180 pound goals and put them into a zone and uh, at the end of the match wherever the, wherever the scoring objects were in the zones and you'll see the Beatty Beast on the, on the uh, left side of the screen, or the, the right side of the screen, excuse me. The, all they did was they swing out, they grab all three goals and they start the death, um, the death crawl inch by inch. Um, in 2002 there wasn't a rule that said you couldn't interact with the carpeting. So um, the Beatty Beast that year decided that, um, decided that it would be best to take file cards and make a crawling or walking drivetrain. So inch by inch, once their robot grabbed onto the goals, there was nothing you could do except watch them for two minutes crawl over and bring all the scoring objects to your side of the field as they just decimated the, uh, the opponents. Um, there were only a few teams that were ever able to to um, defeat that system and you'll see the Bionic Bulldogs uh, and Team 144 both pushing uh, very aggressively on the goals trying to break, break them free, uh, break the Beatty Beast's grip on the, on the carpet and on the goals. Um, and it was just, a, like I said, two minutes of, of painful death of watching your team get beat and there was nothing, nothing you could do because once the beast started to crawl across the field, it just went. So that's, a, that's an excellent execution of a non-traditional drivetrain um, and it was one, one bad robot that won the world championships that year. Um, and I apologize, I forget what link I put in here, um, but I believe that this team uh, 3863, there's a, a bit of laughter in the background and if you, when you have the link to this website, uh, you'll hear the driver of this drivetrain, um, he, he makes a comment or she makes a comment, I, I don't know if it's he or she, but um, something along the lines of, this is amazing, I'm having so much fun. It's important no matter what you do when you're building your first drivetrain, whether it's the holonomic drive, whether it's the death by crawling, um, inch by inch death by crawling in that year. Um, you gotta have fun with it. Uh, otherwise, what, what good is first? What good is this if you can't smile and enjoy the time? So you gotta have fun and this driver was having a blast with this drivetrain. Um, so it's neat to see these examples of the drivetrains um, and keep in mind that you want to have fun. Uh, and again, I think, uh, I think more of having fun uh, is the fact that uh, that year um, I believe that the drivetrain, and it shows it just about halfway through, um, just about halfway through the, uh, through the match, um, you'll see another example of a drivetrain and I'll pause it when I show you because um, I think it's important that we look at that Team 144's drivetrain. Uh, you'll see that it is a tank tread drive system. So now that I've shown you some of these, uh, some of these videos about some of the really cool drivetrains, uh, I want to show one more, one more slide. So we've done the good, we've done the bad, and now the ugly. Um, the, the, there's a team from uh, Eastern Ohio called the, uh, the Mad Cows um, and they have always done a unique drivetrain um, that is actually a walking drivetrain. So it's, a, it's engineering behind that is fantastic. Um, however, in the contest year that year, the robots had to climb a, a small angled ramp that you'll see in the foreground and that was not conducive to a high center of gravity, um, high, uh, well, let's say a low, low contact surface uh, drivetrain. So they ended up becoming uh, um, tipped over quite a few times. And as a matter of fact, some teams coined the phrase that, that unfortunately in that game they were going cow tipping. Um, so it, it was a very innovative design and, um, and very, very, um, uh, but, but very fun to watch. So I, I think that was an important part of theirs. And then in this case, um, this is a team from Columbus, Ohio, um, where they have the McCainum drive, they have the, that holonomic, but in this dimly lit hallway, uh, you can't see it and you can't hear the comments unless you actually watch the video online. Um, but their, their comments are, oh, we've got this great drive system, but nobody can drive it. I, I, can't, I can't program it. So they, they have that system 
and they can't, it's, it's such a complex system to control that if you don't have the right code along with the phenomenally built drivetrain, you're going to run into problems. Um, and so the, there's, a, there's a golden rule, and I know Karthik uses this a lot uh, with the symbotics and all of Karthik's presentations. Um, there's a golden rule in first, and, um, and, and I think I've got it listed at the bottom of the screen, that never overextend your team capabilities. Um, Never extend, never overextend. Make sure you work within your team's capabilities. Um, you don't want that to be a limiting factor, but it realistically is a limiting factor. Um, and when you're building a drivetrain, uh, surface material and slope are very important considerations. So when we look at them, the, uh, that surface material and slope. So as we get into designing drivetrains for first, um, there are several options. I'm going to try and explore uh, at least a few of those options with you to, to make sure that you're good with um, you know the capabilities but these are not the only options so don't just rely on this presentation to help you design your drivetrain but these are some steadfast rules that uh, in the 16 years I've done first that I've found to be the case um, you'll see two-wheel drive systems and four-wheel drive systems the both are um, fairly easy to design because of the Andy Mark kit that you get um, that you can opt to get through the uh, first choice um, and the uh, and through the kickoff they're easy to design because you can pretty much just put the kit together implement it and you've got yourself either two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive systems they're fairly easy to build they're usually lightweight um, inexpensive on the two-wheel drive systems two-wheel drive systems are also very agile um, the two-wheel drive system, basically you're taking as much energy as you can from the motors and you're transmitting that through gear systems, which we'll talk about later, or, um, or direct drive systems to the wheels. You're not able to, to maximize the use of power that, of the motors with just two-wheel drive systems. Um, two-wheel drive systems come in a couple of different forms. So let's take a look at those forms um, that we have. And um, the types of two-wheel drive systems you've got, uh, you've got obviously the the motors in the background uh, on one side either front or back of the machine and a lot of teams will switch to a caster um, so you'll see the driven wheels on the back and then casters in the front very good for agility very good for a flat playing surface but on an inclined plane uh, not so much because you'll find your leading wheels go up the go up the ramp first that's a good way but you don't always get that choice in first uh, which way your team has to approach the ramp and with casters in the front um, oftentimes omni wheels can be used as casters um, but with the uh, casters in the front, your wheels will follow, find uh, an easier path back to the uh, playing surface than if they were uh, driven wheels. So they, they tend to rotate on an inclined plane. Um, and then um, you'll see other, um, other drivetrains. So again, less, less able to hold position on that two-wheel drive. So when we switch over to four-wheel drive systems, again, you get the, easy, the ease of design, the ease of build, the inexpensive, powerful, because now you're driving four wheels, um, you're splitting your robot between all four wheels, so the, the mass is divided across. Um, it's very sturdy and, and very stable. So a four-wheel drive system, um, you'll see that uh, we'll have two different, two different directions um, that you'll go. But typically, um, you'll see four-wheel drive with two gearboxes, so you're not direct driving your wheels, although some teams do opt to direct drive the wheels. Um, we'll, we'll cover that on the next presentation in advanced, advanced design. Um, but when you see the driven wheels can be chain or belt, um, thanks to the Gates Manufacturing Company, we all get access to, bait, uh, to belts and um, drive pulleys that we can mount up to the, um, to the kit bot materials. Uh, so you'll get your choice of how you want to transmit the power, either belt or chain. Um, and you'll also see uh, four-wheel drive with four gearboxes. Um, so you'll see those systems where you can see each wheel driven independently. Uh, with the kit bot, you'll also see that you get the option of designing a base that could be wide and um, a wide mouth ba uh, base, short and depth, or you can go a long base that's narrow. Um, both of which, um, both of which. Uh, the, uh, those drive systems on four-wheel drive, you have to take into consideration the scrub friction of when you're trying to turn. So without articulating your wheels, you'll need to make sure that you have gone through an evaluation of that friction on the surface. Um, so the next ones that we're going to mention um, to go through is, is teams in first are starting to, re starting to realize, and, and this is possible through the Andy Mark um, kit base as well, 
the six wheel drive systems. Um, we can also go to N wheel drive, which is N just being a variable of the amount of wheels. You'll see teams with uh, six wheels and then you'll see teams with eight wheels and um, I've even seen teams with 16 wheel drive bases and actually I may have a, a picture of them coming up. Uh, so looking at the six wheel drive, uh, six wheel drive systems, uh, essentially it's a modification of the four wheel drive. Um, as we look at the benefits, it's fairly easy design as well, fairly easy to build with the, uh, with the kit bot frame. Uh, it, you get very powerful, um, stable and agile base with it. Um, you can actually get a couple of different ways for agility. Uh, what we do typically with the Andy Mark kit is you get a lower contact point on the center wheels, which essentially gives you uh, that dropped center wheel becomes your turning system. Uh, although weight management and center of balance management becomes really critical when you look at that, um, that dropped center and I'll show you some pictures later on about what, what design considerations you need with the upper half of your robot when you choose a base that has the, the dropped center wheel. Um, you can run, the, the second way to be agile besides the drop center is run omni wheels on the front, back, or both. So omni wheels on the outside corners um, and keeping your drive wheels on the center drive is a really good, uh, it's a really good thought to have. Uh, typically, uh, this six wheel drive is the gold standard. I, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's pretty heavy uh, percentage at how many teams use the six wheel drive uh, driven through two gearboxes, whether they're transmissions or straight one to one uh, outputs, meaning no, no shifting involved with the gearboxes. But um, the, the, the simple easiness of this system, um, getting fast, powerful, and the agility that you need makes it the de facto standard in first. Um, so you can see that that gold standard is, uh, is what's common. Um, the end wheel drive is just another modification of that, of that six wheel drive system, which is a modification or derivative of the, of the, of the uh, four wheel drive system. And so you'll see the, the picture of the, of the drive system. Essentially what you come up with when you have this end wheel drive driven by two gearboxes is you get tank tread drive system on wheels. Um, you could have as many wheels as you want. In the picture here it's got basically a 10 wheel drive system. Um, the, the image on the screen, um, same thing. It looks like it's got seven wheels on each side, so a 14 wheel drive system. Uh, again, the sole benefit is, uh, of this is like a tank drive system is when you have a variable surface, a variable playing surface, variable height playing surface that you can um, traverse objects. So when we look at all of the designs, um, you know, the agility, again, lowering the contact points and then omni wheels in the front, back, center, both, or the whole thing omni wheels, um, when you have that end wheel drive system, um, as we go through the, uh, pardon me, the um, tread drive is very similar to end wheel. This is like the uh, Team 144 in 2002 um, when they had the, the Brecoflex belting um, on their uh, rough top belting on their drive system. Uh, an amazing amount of surface contact and when you have surface contact you're able to transmit as much energy as you can um, instead of four points or six points of contact. When you have, an, when you have a belt that's driving across you have a, a very large surface area that you are transmitting the torque from motors to floor, which gives you the motion mobility that you're looking for. So when we look at it, um, very powerful, very strong, very stable. Um, where you put the gearboxes is entirely up to you and your team's design uh, because it could go anywhere in the system, whichever belt you're driving, whichever end of the belt you're driving. Um, not always agile, although I'm sure that people could come up with uh, counterpoints to the agility. Um, it's definitely not as agile as a swerve drive machine. Um, it's, it's typically heavy. Um, it's typically expensive because the alignment is critical um, and making sure that you have the machining capabilities to, um, to build this belt tread system uh, can be expensive. And then the last point is that it's very hard to maintain. Um, because of the belting and uh, or it sh can be hard to maintain. So um, this, uh, this system is used and you'll see it used uh, commonly in first teams. Uh, two other types of drivetrains that are really starting to come alive, although I'll tell you that crab drive steering has been around since the year 2000 when Chief Delphi Team 47 uh, came out. That was the first time I saw it back in 2000 um, when they came out and their robot moved sideways. The whole crowd just stopped and it went silent and everybody just said, 
wow, what a revolution. And now we're seeing teams um, selling entire Swerve Drive modules where all you do is plug and play. Um, and you're seeing the, the Swerve Drive uh, has that awe factor, that, that, that amazement. And then um, with the Swerve Drives, you'll see that there's an inherent amount of complexity um, when, you start to when you start to run through the vector calculations of how to co coordinate uh, each wheel system if they're independently driven. So each wheel needing to rotate to steer, although you could link all of them together um, on a turning system, uh, a lot of teams are going with independent drives for each wheel. Um, you're losing um, you're losing that simp simplicity of just a four or six wheel drive machine and you have to have a very complex control system um, to, maintain the, to maintain the direction. It is extremely possible, but the investment, again, you cannot overextend your team's capabilities. You've got to keep that in mind. Um, so as you come into this, you'll the, 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 one of the videos that I showed uh, of, of one of the teams, it's very, very hard to control this at first. Um, so, when we look at that, that swerve drive, um, we look at crab drive steering, that's, that's part of the, uh, the process. And then if we look at the uh, holonomic drive, or what's called the kilo method, the kilo method has, is developed by, um, or used by a lot of teams. Um, we also call them kiwi drives. You'll see three wheel, three wheel drive systems. Um, a little bit more, um, basically a, a mecanum system where you're setting up your wheels offset 90 degree or offset in the corners by 45 degrees each and um, and then you're able to achieve forward and backwards by driving your wheels opposite to each other side to side again very uh, a little bit more simple to control than the independent independent steering um, for each wheel um, but what you're finding out here is that you'll get minimum pushing power a little bit of a jittery, jittery ride because these omni wheels or the mecanum wheels uh, create a bounce an inherent bounce on the surface um, as they rotate through. Uh, that could be mitigated a little bit by going uh, with dual, dual wheels that offset, by, that offset the, uh, the uh, omni wheels by uh, whatever fraction to, to make sure that you're always in contact with the ground. But um, again, one of the underlying themes is uh, this incline difficulty. Um, if you don't know the field surfaces, it's hard to design your, your drive system. And that's, I think, why we go to this next point. Uh, it is very important that when you figure out, or when you're starting to figure out what drive system you want to use, I would strongly recommend that you have a very good idea of the field surfaces. Whether they are uh, carpet, whether it's um, the um, polycarbonate surfaces, whether it's plywood um, or the uh, regolith that they used in 2009. Um, so as, as, we look, as we look at this next video, um, the history of FIRST is uh, a little bit uh, telling about all the different playing surfaces that FIRST has used up through 2011. Um, and uh, you got to notice how, how old uh, Woody and Dean have gotten, <laughs> excuse me, and you'll see, you'll see a little bit about their, uh, their age through this video, um, which again comes from our, our friends as we go through commercial. Um, the, uh, the video of Woody and Dean, it shows them in their younger years when FIRST was getting started back in 92 and uh, with Maze Craze. So we'll skip through the video and now here is, uh, this is from the Hadrim team in Israel. Um, first year was maze craze. It was a bed of corn. So you had to build a drive system. And these robots were tethered um, back then, but it was a bed of corn that, that you had to drive through. Um, Rug Rage in uh, the next year, 93, uh, playground balls, but again, a flat, open, carpeted surface. Um, in 94, it was soccer balls on a carpeted surface. However, in the center of the field was a, an upright goal um, with a polycarbonate surface floor. So again, you had to take into consideration the, the coefficient of friction with that. 1995, again, a massive incline plane that proved to be um, a, a very hard task to climb. Um, 96, again, a big octagon where the playing field was fairly open with a carpeted surface. This time the goal was mobile. It would move around basing, uh, sliding on its friction of the base. 
Uh, toroid terror, again, an open field. However, the goal was on swivels. So you had a, a very large open, um, open sliding field. In 97 or 98, um, ladder logic, you had a carpeted field with a very large obstacle in the center and around each of the, each of the arms. 99 had a movable uh, puck, they called it, but again, a very square and open, uh, open floor. But that puck was on casters, so it slid around um, the field. And, uh, and that, by the way, 99 was the first year for alliances. Uh, it was two on two. Uh, but then this was the year. There's 47 right there with their crab drive system. That was just the wow factor. Um, and in uh, 2001, this was a year that we had the tri-stable bridge. Uh, this was a year where we had uh, an alliance of four. And it was four versus zero. It was your, your alliance versus the clock. Uh, again, in 2002, Zone Zeal, where the Beatty machine just crawls across the field, um, just decimating everyone. Um, 2003, we had Stack Attack. The ramp in the center uh, was actually a wire mesh, so you had to take that into consideration, and then the polycarbonate surface on top. The 2004 year was a, uh, a six-inch step that you had to climb. Um, to get to the 10 foot chin up bar, once you got your, uh, once you got your, your ball stuffed in the goal, there was a six inch platform. Um, and then in 2005, it was the, uh, it was a year that was a wide open floor minus the, the Tetra scoring uh, areas, but it was a wide open carpeted floor. 2006, again, carpet with the ramps in aim high. Uh, the ramps were a 30 degree diamond plate incline, uh, or 30 degree incline with diamond plate with a polycarb surface on top. Then uh, big open field with the spider in the center, the, uh, the rack in rack and roll in 2007. And then that year you could climb up other machines. So you had to take into consideration, could you climb the other machines? Uh, everybody's favorite NASCAR track event now, the overdrive in 2008, where we had to uh, make as many laps as you can. And now lunacy, regolith. This was virtually a skating rink. So taking into consideration all those years of having similar playing surfaces with carpet and then throw in a plastic floor. Um, the field here is broken up in 2010 with breakaway with these uh, massive bumps, which obviously teams could climb. Um, however, your drivetrain, you had to consider those. 2011, when we had the, uh, the race across the field with a big open field again on logo motion. Um, so if we look at the, the history of first, uh, if you look at the history of first, you'll see that, uh, that the playing surfaces have been varied. Uh, however, one of the stable one of the stable parts, uh, if we look at 2012 also, not on video, but 2012 was uh, the uh, basketball with three tri-stable, or three, I wouldn't say tri-stable bridges, but three unstable bridges um, that we had access to. The, uh, and then in uh, 2013, with the, uh, with the pyramids in it. Uh, again, big, both of those years, big open carpeted fields with some obstacles. So as we look at the first history, the, the mainstay of first has been carpet. So when we look at drive systems, you can pre-work as much as you want, but you never know what you're gonna get. They threw everyone a massive curveball with a regolith in 2009. So who knows what you're gonna get in a drive system for this next year. Um, so I think at this point in time, I'm going to take a break and ask for questions from the audience. Uh, if any of you have questions about the history of FIRST, any of the drivetrains, and maybe discuss why. And, uh, and the advanced drivetrain system, um, we will go over some of these requirements um, when we look at um, robot drive systems in, uh, in particular, when we get down to the actual design of them. So we're going to pause, and I'll answer questions. What's a regular surface? So the regolith, imagine, uh, imagine the fake ice on a skating rink. So it's, um, it's a polymer, a plastic surface, and you couldn't have a drive system to scratch it, scrape it, or gain traction on that. So a lot of the wheels that they went with, we've gone through plaction wheels with like wedge top tread that interacts with the carpeting very nicely. Um, you didn't, in 2009, you didn't want your robot to have too much traction because you're towing around a goal and the object was to keep the other teams from scoring in your goal, and you score as much as you can, right? So when you're sliding, you want that drift. You want that skid. So you wanted to reduce friction, not entirely because you still needed to be mobile, but you wanted to reduce friction. So regolith is, uh, is, is a slippery plastic surface. More questions about inclined planes? or? 
these guys hear me all day at school. How'd I do so far? Any questions from you? Because you've been through it a lot. Any questions on the drivetrains? Did I miss any of them? So. Did I cover them ac accurately? Yeah. That's what I thought. So that's just the basics, but you want me to continue? I got another hour. This is where we get into the math. We can keep going. What do you guys, you want to take a break? You guys need a break? Because I don't want to put you to sleep. All right, let's do that. Let's pause. Championships to watch today. Okay. So we're good. Everybody's back on. The, uh, the first part of the session was talking about just general drivetrains and looking at configurations, shapes, um, and orientation of robots. This next section that we're going we're gonna to focus on are going to be these six concepts in, uh, in robot drive systems. Uh, drive system requirements, traction fundamentals, the first motors that we're going to be able to use, gearing fundamentals on those, mo on those motors and gearboxes, uh, system design conditions that you might encounter, and then practical considerations is where we'll end up um, on, this, uh, on this presentation today. So as we're looking at this, the, the more advanced drive system um, design system, we will look at the, uh, at the drive system requirements. Uh, one of the first things that you need to do is determine what you want your robot to do. Uh, before you start designing your machine, before you start building anything, uh, you've got to know, you've got to define that problem statement. You have got to um, completely investigate the game rules and develop a team strategy on how to play the game before you design the actual first robot drivetrain. Um, you don't want to design yourself into a corner with, uh, with a drivetrain and not have it play the game you want it to play. So spend some time, make sure that you decide what you want your robot to do um, before you start to, to put the base together. Uh, it'll save you some rework as we go through the very short six week build season. It absolutely should be a team effort. As you go through this evaluation, when you're evaluating your robot drivetrain and, and your robot in, as a whole, uh, make sure you evaluate the uh, system attributes. And of course, everybody wants to have the fastest, most agile, strongest robot um, that you could possibly make. However, uh, in reality, you have trade-offs that you have to make. There are always trade-offs between speed and torque. There are always trade-offs between maneuverability and strength, agility and strength. Um, whether it's got obstacles to do. So um, again, when I stole this, when I stole this chart, um, it goes through and it lists out what attribute you have in your drivetrain and the good feature that will, the feature of your drivetrain that will help you um, help you have that attribute. So uh, in specific. When we look at uh, pushing or pulling or climbing, uh, one concept that's important uh, is traction. Uh, and as you go through, you, perhaps that perhaps you'll have uh, some uh, a consideration or drive attribute that you need where you need speed instead of just that traction. Uh, so you'll have to choose the right gear ratio if you're looking for that top end speed or the acceleration. So as you're designing, keep in mind that traction and gearing become two very critical parts of your robot. Even if you don't want high end speed, traction is extremely important. Even if you don't want um, to have the, you want to have an agile robot, traction will be important on the playing surface. So those are two areas that, that you cannot avoid. Um, so we're going to look into those traction fundamentals and, and just get a, a cursory look. I, I'm going to bla blast through the speed on these, uh, the fundamentals so you can come back and do the math calculations afterwards. Um, but as we look at traction fundamentals, there's some terminology that we have to, dis that we have to explain. Um, obviously, the weight of your machine um, as it sits on the ground is opposed by what we call the normal force. The normal force is the, the force that the object of the playing surface is pushing back on your robot. Uh, again, without normal force, your robot starts to sink into the playing surface. So normal force is opposing the, the weight of your machine. Uh, again, mass and gravity making up the weight. Uh, torque is the rotational force that you're applying from your wheel to that playing surface where you have to apply a tractive force by your wheels and that playing surface to get that resultant motion. So as you're looking at this, uh, as you're looking at this quick chart, the maximum tractive force is a simple calculation of the coefficient of friction or the constant of the two materials, uh, both the wheel surface and the playing surface, uh, times the normal force. So the maximum tractive force that you can get uh, is that uh, simple calculation. So when you look at the, the friction coefficient for any given contact with the floor, um, it's multiplied by that normal 
normal force is going to give you the maximum tractive force. That maximum tractive force, tractive force is what propels your robot. If you don't have maximum tractive force, your wheels slip on the playing surface and your robot sits there going nowhere fast. Um, so it's, it's, what important, it's, it's very important to make sure that you have that, that maximum tractive force accomplished. Now here's some really good trigonometry for everybody, for all you, all you mathemat mathematicians at home. Um, Friction force. So we're talking about tractive force. We want to develop this, this friction force so that we can, um, so we can accelerate our robot or move our robot. And that little Greek letter mu in this formula, in the top formula, uh, stands for the coefficient of friction. That coefficient of friction times the normal force will give you that tractive force or that friction force that you want to accomplish. That can be calculated out in a couple of different ways. Uh, one through experimentation and another one through mathematics um, and uh, an actual uh, knowing the durometer of the materials or what you're working on if it's a rubber material or, or knowing the material surfaces. So very rarely will uh, companies uh, give you the um, coefficient of friction for the surfaces of your drivetrain. They just, there's so many, so many variables about the two materials that you might have that manufacturers just aren't going to spec out the coefficient of friction. Uh, so thankfully our first community has done a fantastic job of coming up with some of these coefficients of friction based on traditionally used first wheels or first drive materials and first playing surfaces. Again, you don't know what you're getting this year, so you, you never know. Uh, everyone's a rookie, so to speak, with that. Um, but as you look, you can calculate out normal forces and, uh, and parallel forces to determine um, what this coefficient of friction is between two materials. Um, one test that we like to do, I'll, 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 I'll tell you, is um, basically as you calculate out your friction force, your coefficient of friction is quite simply the tangent of the angle at which when you pick up one surface or you incline a plane, when you incline a plane and the robot starts to slide, it's that tangent of that angle where the robot starts to slide or the material starts to slide that, is, that determines your, your coefficient of friction. So one quick look at it, if, if, if you can use your trig tables very quickly, if you come up with a 45 degree angle um, where the robot material starts to slide, when you take the tangent of 45 degrees, you'll find out you have a coefficient of friction of one. So if you increase that up to a steeper angle, say 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees, if your material still hasn't slid down, you're going towards an infinite coefficient of friction. So um, as you get closer and closer to vertical and over the top, if your robot material still hasn't slid down, you've got some really, really grippy stuff. Um, I, I've yet to meet that grippy stuff where you'd use it as a drivetrain. Um, I don't think you want that. We'll cover that later too in the presentation. So as we look at it, um, this is just an experimental method, an experimental method for delivering the coefficient of friction between two surfaces. Incline a plane, take the tangent of the angle at which the material starts to slide down when, when gravity starts to work against it, there's your coefficient of friction. Another way you could do it um, is you could determine the coefficient of friction um, by simply using a spring scale and pulling the material. And as it starts to slide, you can look at that force um, and you could figure out that the force of the pull over the force of the weight or the normal force um, it, between the two surfaces will give you a coefficient of friction as well. And one thing to remember when you're using these calculations for your coefficient of friction is that coefficient of friction is a dimensionless quantity. So it is just a number, uh, a number that respect, that with respect of, um, of the type of materials between each other. So that coefficient of friction is dimensionless. So it's really nice when you have forces negating out the forces and you come up with a coefficient of friction. So. Um, Typically, you don't get to choose. Um, so as we look at it, uh, traction, well, you do get to choose one aspect of it. So traction fundamentals, if we use the friction coefficient, it's dependent on the materials that you use in the robot, um, wheels or belts or something in the like. It's dependent on the shape of the wheels or belts. And it's dependent on the material of the floor surface. And the last area is the surface conditions. And um, each one of those affects your coefficient of friction as you look at it. And remember, what we're trying to do in this is we're trying to deliver maximum tractive force. You want your robot to move when you want it to move. You don't want the robot to slip unless that's the design. You do want it to slip uh, as in the regolith um, in that year. So as we look at this, the coefficient of friction is determined by the material of the robot wheels. What's really nice about it is we have some, some people in FIRST that have actually gone through and figured out these static 
friction coefficients for these materials based on the same carpet that first is used since 1993. Um, it's a similar carpeting. And so as we go through, we come out with these, uh, the a free spinning caster has a coefficient of friction of 0.1. Um, uh, and again, uh, high friction coefficient of these numbers as you go up closer to 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, um, that is typically, typically soft or spongy materials or what we call sticky materials. Um, and if it has a low coefficient of friction, it's typically harder materials, um, smoother or shiny materials. So that's a good way of, of guessing a coefficient of friction and determining, you know, hey, if this is really smooth and shiny and hard plastic, your coefficient of friction is probably going to be fairly low, especially when you look at an inclined plane that may have uh, a, you know, of a varying maybe polycarbonate or a varying playing surface. So in FIRST Robotics, uh, you, don't always, uh, you don't always want these coefficient of friction um, numbers to be high or to be low. Um, so it's often that, that good materials or these um, high coefficients of friction, they wear out faster than the lower numbers, uh, than the bad materials. We say the higher coefficient of friction you have, the better it is, is not necessarily the option. So you want to make sure that good material isn't too good and it doesn't keep you from being, um, uh, fr from, from gaining too much tractive force. And in, in, a, in a nutshell, you, you don't want it to just completely wear out faster. So that's an important part of this. Uh, so, and as a side note, uh, read the rules because you want to make sure that what you have tried and tested is going to be legal and allowed to be used on your first robot because hey you don't want to get to competition and find out that your material just isn't uh, isn't legal to use in a first robot. Um, so the second area besides the material is the the shape of the robot wheel and what you'll find is um, the surface uh, you, if you can, you want it to be like the Beatty Beast of 2002. Uh, in 2002, they interlocked with the carpet. They literally got in and embedded the drivetrain. They used file cards to crawl across the floor, and those file cards dug into the carpet. Of course, now that's been outlawed. You cannot use that. It's, it's against the rules in FIRST now to interact with the carpet in that manner. Um, but if you want to make sure that if you can on a large scale, find some way to shape your wheel such that it, it interlocks with the playing surface in a legal manner. You want to make sure that the shape of your wheels um, can help deliver the traction that you need. On a small scale, uh, again, if you look at the carpet surfaces, it's not even, it's not flat, um, as if a plastic or polycarbonate surface would be, but that carpeting, you do want to have as much interaction as you can um, on the materials. So on the small scale, that shape of that wheel becomes important or the shape of that tread becomes important in delivering the ma maximum tractive force. Uh, the material, hey, you can't change this. First decides what it's going to be. you got to design around that constraint. This is one of the unknowns that you can do nothing about. Um, but you have to be sure that you explore what the surface of your wheel, how it will interact with all the playing field surfaces. Um, so in the case of a ramp where you have a, a, an aluminum diamond plate or if you have a polycarbonate ramp or a plywood ramp um, or in the case of the regolith, I, I keep bringing that one up, um, the material is determined by first. So you want to know what surfaces you're going to be interacting with. Um, and then you want to make sure you know what the playing surfaces, uh, how you're interacting with them and the surface of your wheels. You want to make sure that those surface conditions are also taken into consideration. Uh, take for example a super sticky wheel, a very high coefficient of friction that happens to pull up some carpet fibers and dust and, and, and whatnot from the pit area and from the carpet itself. When you get onto the playing field, that sticky surface that you're counting on being sticky may be covered in carpet dust and fibers. And so you want to make sure that if you want it to be sticky, that you take the extra time to clean the wheels in the pit area. I, I've actually seen people drive a wheel with a file to actually take off an extra layer of the wheel, not for size constraints, but because they want to re, uh, resurface the wheels. So um, in some cases, you want the uh, clean and tacky surfaces, and dirty, oily surfaces might be a bad thing um, for your team. Uh, on the flip side, you may want that reversed. So always make sure that you, you explore your surface condition with traction. Um, so you don't want it to be too dependent, though, on that surface condition. Uh, you can't always control it in the case of the championships when you have five minutes to fix your machine and clean it up uh, and get it recharged and back out there for the finals match number two that you're going to win and become the world champion. You don't want to have to take 
time to tether your robot, file down the outside edge, clean off the, the extra carpet debris. To, you know, it's just too much. You want to have a simple machine um, for that in that case. So um, you don't always uh, you don't always want to do that. But if you have that, don't forget to clean them. Um, so as we look more at the normal force, this is about weight distribution. Weight distribution becomes a critical step when you do a multi-drive system, whether it's a two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive system. But as you look, when you have two-wheel drive system, you split your normal force between the two wheels. This we will start looking at. Um, weight distribution of the upper half of your machine and as you're designing your drivetrain this is a consideration you always want to keep your center balance between your two wheels otherwise your robot ends up on its front or its back and that's not a condition that's conducive to winning matches so um, you want to make sure that your normal force divided between the wheels that are in contact with the ground um, which again weight distribution becomes a really critical step um, and in that weight distribution, uh, if you have your weight distributed around the back wheel, um, your wheel, that, that mass will be forcing down uh, and your equal and opposite force will get you more tractive force um, from the back end of your machine uh, with less weight. And again, this will have, um, this will have the, the predisposition to ride um, with less force on the front on the front wheels, which could be helpful if you have a machine that needs to have scrub friction as it's turning. So the orientation of your robot uh, will have that uh, grip in the back and slide in the front, so to speak. Um, however, when you start to cantilever an arm or a mechanism off the front or back of your machine, um, this could be used as a counterbalance. So say you would like to distribute normal forces between the two wheels, load up your mechanisms heavily on the back side, arm and mass out in the front side, um, of course within the constraints of the starting configuration of your robot, but this is a way that you could counterbalance the weight um, between, the, uh, between the sides. But if it's an arm that's mobile, that it's in uh, changing in position, uh, then you'll see that again, you run into that mass being outside of your wheelbase. And again, mass outside of wheelbase, robot ends up on backside, which isn't driving anywhere. Um, so the arm position makes an important part, or the mechanisms on top, not just an arm. Um, so you'll actually see some robots that they'll have um, that they'll have uh, shifting mechanisms that, that can move, and that weight on the arm can be a counterbalance. However, one thing that a lot of teams don't consider um, in their drivetrain development is the fact that this weight transfer is not just a static condition. So when you start to add in the, the motion, the acceleration, that inertial force, that when your robot goes from zero miles an hour to say six miles an hour, um, you have motors and gears and mechanisms that are not being propelled except by their attachment to the base. So you have this inertial force exerted on the components that are going in the opposite direction. The higher up they are in your robot, the higher your center of gravity. The higher center of gravity means uh, where that tractive force is applied to the ground that your robot um, can lose that tractive force as you again pass your center of balance in front or behind the robot. So you always want to make sure uh, that, that if your drivetrain train design um, isn't balanced that you don't just ride the wheelie across the floor uh, or if you do ride the wheelie make sure that you're able to slow it down enough to keep that front wheel down on the ground keep your center of balance between the two wheels even though you might be just the base team designing a drive base you do need to account for the rest of the mechanisms going vertically through your robot so when you consider those transient conditions like um, acceleration, movement. Um, let's say there's some, what do we call it in first, vigorous interaction between the robots. You want to make sure that that, that, that force, um, when you bump into a robot, what's going to happen with your drivetrain? What's going to happen when your robot picks up an object? Say it's a, an eight pound ball at three, four feet away from the center of your mass of your robot. What's that going to do to your drive system? How will you drive your robot with no wheels or only two of the four wheels or two of the eight wheels on the ground? Um, you need to be able to consider all these conditions. Again, that's why the initial design and evaluation of your drivetrain becomes such an important player throughout the robot. Question. Have you ever simulated that on one of your designs? We have gone through and used um, the uh, 3D Studio Max um, uh, quite a few years ago. I had a student that was very proficient in 3D Studio Max, and I believe uh, Autodesk Inventor and SolidWorks have an inertial. Um, evaluative tool 
but we have not taken the time to go through and do that. In Max, Max doesn't have real mechanics. I believe you can. Really? I believe you can put gravitational constraints on it, um, and you could set it up. I, I could be wrong, but. Well, there's a there's a 2D software called Working Model. Yeah. Working Model does a really nice job of adding inertial forces and gravitational forces, but it's a 2D version. Uh, there's probably a 3D version out there, but I've never used it. I've always had Working Model 2D, and that's the other system that we've used to evaluate just just those basic forces. Yeah. Exactly, and and I mean. The, and it's really tricky when you start looking at a 30 degree inclined plane that first is thrown at us several times and then a tri-stable bridge or a tipsy bridge that, you know, there's a lot of you know, kinetic forces. Here, what happens if your robot suddenly stops immediately because it hits somebody? Yeah. Will, it, will the top fall off? You know? Yeah. Not just fall off, will it carry over and yeah. take the rest of the machine over and you see it. You see it happen so many times where the, the team had not considered those options. And so once you build the robot, it's a little late. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, once you're four weeks in or five weeks in, you really can change a lot. So, um, and, and you have to evaluate in these transient conditions what can cause the robot to lose the traction. So again, you want to keep that robot four on the floor, six on the floor, eight on the floor, so that you've got that propulsion. Um, so as we look at this, um, the first motors, uh, I'm, I'm going to gloss through this really quickly uh, and make sure that, that everybody's comfortable because there's been a tremendous amount of research. When I first started in this competition back in 1998 and 99, we had to do all the, all the digging and all the research. Every team did it independently. However, with First Motors now, uh, you have wonderful, wonderful resources from, um, uh, from a lot of different sources. The teams that have gone through and done motor characteristics where uh, the speed torque curves were established, where you've gotten teams that have set up entire test labs based on how much power can you derive from a motor at 40 amps, which 40 amps is the max power uh, 40 amps is the max current that you can draw on a first robot, although most of the motors are limited down to 30 amps current draw. But what's the max power that you can get? And most of you'll find most of those max powers are, are derived at, at 120 amps or, or some maximum current that these motors can actually draw. Uh, but you're limited in first. You don't have more than 40 amps um, to draw on an individual motor. So when you go through that first motor, um, when you compare them and combine them, um, what do you come up with? And as we know, uh, or you may not know this, um, speed and torque are inversely proportional. The relationship between speed and torque, if you want to increase speed, you're going to lose out on torque. Uh, motors are fixed at a certain wattage. They have a certain power output, and that power output has to be maximized in your design um, at 40 amps. So. When you look at a motor, you can come up with numbers like stall torque and, um, and then stall current. How much current are you drawing when you stall the motor out? And then you've got free speed when your motor's just running with no load on it whatsoever. And how much current are you drawing? And, and it makes a really pretty graph when you do that. Um, and that, that graph is very helpful. However, um, we don't get to play with that stall torque. You will never um, be able to design it. So you have to evaluate your motor with a stall torque limited at 40 amps. Um, so not the stall torque, but the torque limited at 40 amps. So when you look at, um, when you look at, the, uh, at the motors that we have to use, um, we have to consider, do we want a torque? Do we want to use the torque or do we want to use the speed? Or where is the combination which is most advantageous in our drivetrain? Um, and again, this slide shows the limitation at 40 amps of current, where is the design going to fall for our robot when we want it designed for speed or torque? So somewhere in this range, you've got to figure out which motor you're going to use um, at 40 amps current draw or max current draw. And then again, with that 40 amp current draw, you have to manage the rest of your machine because you have a limited amount of current for each match that you're driving in because you've got a, a deep cycle um, gel cell battery that you're going to use or a, um, one of the 12 volt ba batteries that first provides us that you have to use on your robot. So you have a limited supply of electricity on board in the two, two minute match or two minute and 15 second match. So you've got to carry that through your entire machine and you certainly don't want to be drawing 40 amps at all times from all four motors um, or near 40 amps um, because you're going to kill your battery very, very quickly, and your robot will be sitting somewhere on the field, lonely, dead, and, and lights out. Um, so you definitely have to consider that in your drivetrain design um, when you're going through to figure out. So 
optimum design does not mean drawing 40 amps continuously and running it at that torque or at that speed. So, um, and this again, Paul Capioli did a phenomenal job from the Thunder Chickens and uh, he has gone through and done a, uh, a, a tip that says design your drive motor max power for 40 amp. Um, that's a max power. Um, and that's if you're in a big shoving match, you want to have it geared low, high power trans transmission, or if you're screaming across the field to deliver those last four Frisbees into the goal, you want to make sure you have enough speed to do that. Um, and um, you want to do that. Power is absolute. Uh, that's an important step. Power is absolute. Um, it determines your speed torque trade-off. Um, so if you look at a couple of the motors that have gone through, we've gone through the evaluation, um, pointing out um, some of the, the sim motor, which is, and again, I'm speaking based on last year's information and the years before, um, because you don't know what motors you're going to get from year to year. You never know if you're going to get um, a sim motor or a Fisher Price motor or a DeWalt motor. You don't know those. So uh, you're going to rely heavily on, unless you have a test lab, um, i.e. Dr. Joe, um, if, you're, if you don't have a, a test lab uh, to, to set up and evaluate your motors, I, I know there's some, some folks on the Chief Delphi community that use uh, the, the username Ether. Uh, also, um, there, there's Squirrel. There's quite a few folks out there who've done some amazing jobs of evaluating the motors uh, to develop this resource for first. But if you don't have that capability, you're going to rely heavily on what does it do and how close can I get it? And you're going to need to use the manufacturer specs that are listed on the first website to derive um, this uh, stall torque, this T0, um, WF is free speed, and you're going to look at it and you say, well, I can get the sim motor to spin 5,342 RPM, and what you'll find is, no, you're not actually going to get that free speed because there's, there's consideration when you start to load down a motor, you trade off that free speed, and you're not going to get an optimum amount of 2.45 newton meters of stall torque that you can use on the machine. What you find is, and Paul has done this for us, um, you find the torque at 40 amps and then you find the speed at 40 amps. So as we look at it, we are actually not going to use the full 342 watts available from the motor from the, from the motor specifications because that would be drawing 114 amps and you just can't do that. So you can only draw 40 amps of current which means you're going to get about 0.8 newton meters from a sim motor and you're going to be running um, a, a maximum power on a first robot of about 305 watts. So what's really nice about that is um, you've got this data that's been, that's been churned out and that's again based on the certain sim motors that we had in that year uh, and Fisher Price. So as you do a direct comparison really quickly, when we used to get Fisher Price motors in the kit, you would look at the max power and say, my goodness, 403 watts is certainly a much better motor to use than 342 watts on the sim motors. Um, especially with the real estate that these Fisher Price motors took up, they were tiny. Um, however, these tiny motors, even cranking out 403 watts, um, would spin at about four times, uh, four, four times the speed. So even, even though you've got a, a more powerful motor uh, wattage-wise, what you lose out on is uh, the fact that uh, he, you're going to have to gear this one down considerably to get an even speed out. Um, so even under 40, 40 amps of current draw, your torque, notice the torque difference. It's amazing. But when you gear down in speed, you gear up in torque. But the wattage is the key. That power is absolute. At 40 amps, the Fisher, Price, or the, the Fisher Price motors are only about 17 watts greater or stronger than the sim motors. So while they look like they're a considerable advantage in power um, with about 58 amps um, or so, 50, 50 uh, 60 amps, 61 amps, or 61 watts, excuse me, initial uh, of peak power, when it comes down to it, using it on a first robot, you're only getting about 17 watts more. So the sim motors still come out to be a very useful tool because your gear ratio um, is not that significant that you would need to get on the output. So design consideration again, which, which motors do you want to use? Um, it, it becomes a trade-off on speed and torque and power, but that power is the absolute consideration. Uh, you'll see a lot of teams combine motors, so you'll get teams uh, matching sim motors to Fisher Price motors with different gear ratios and being able to use both. That's another um, look at your team resources and determine do you have the capabilities to combine these motors. Um, 
I like to try and match the motors at free speed. Uh, you can go through and match them at any speed that you want when you're designing your gearboxes and designing your, your drivetrains. Um, typically, when I used meshed gears, um, I use an efficiency of about 95% um, to make sure that, that when I'm looking at matching these gear ratios, you want to consider that efficiency to determine um, you know, if you're 5 or 10% off on speeds between the two, you won't get them playing happily in a gearbox together, uh, which I'll touch more on the gear ratios later um, in the presentation. And so, again, when you combine motors, you'll see the, uh, the wattage out if you go Fisher Price and Sims. Um, wattage is, um, it is an additive force. Uh, additive power. So as we look at two, two SIM motors put together, um, you can get up to 611 watts of power out of, out of, the, uh, out of those um, motors if they were coupled together. And yes, there are teams that have combined two SIM motors and a Fisher-Price motor into one gearbox, and they have essentially three motor drive per gearbox, which gives them a thousand watts, which is, you know, uh, one and a half horsepower that's pretty hefty on, on your gearboxes. So um, that's based on the fact that 746 watts is one horsepower. Um, so as we look at this, uh, it's, a significant, it's a significant gain when you start to couple the motors together. So when you want to push robots around or you want to be able to accelerate quickly out of an area, wattage is your key and that's the way you're going to design it. So briefly talk about the uh, gear ratios. Uh, torque is the ability to exert a rotational force, um, a rotational force on a wheel or an object. Um, so in our case, it's the ability to make the wheels turn to make your robot drive forward. Torque determines whether or not you can do something, whether or not you can get that rotational force. Power is the rate at which the energy is delivered. So um, how quickly we get the wheel to spin. So uh, power determines how quickly you can get it done, how fast. When we look at drive systems, um, now with the Gates Manufacturing uh, Company donating the belts to us, you have to really consider uh, chain versus belt drive system. Um, when you're looking at gear ratios, when you're looking at gear ratios, um, you have a, a turning gear, uh, which is usually driven, and a drive gear on the output. So you have a driven gear and a drive gear. Your ratio um, is determined by that uh, driven gear and the drive gear. So uh, it's a mathematical calculation to figure out your gear ratio and you always invert the opposite. Speed, if you're increasing speed, then you're decreasing your torque. If you're increasing torque, you're decreasing your speed on the output. Uh, spur gears, if you want to use spur gears through, say, well, I don't know, an Andy Mark super shifter, that uses spur gears internally. Um, and internally on that shifter, those are gears that are meshing together. Those spur gears are typically designed at about a 99, 98, 99% efficiency um, that you can consider that 99% that efficiency. However, the manufacturing can alter that. So a, a less tolerant manufacturing could drive your efficiency down to about 94% from drive to driven gear and you want to make sure that the, the, the system you're using maximizes that efficiency. So the power going into the gearbox equals as close to the power going out of the gearbox. You want to minimize that loss. And so as you look at a chain or belt drive system, the maximum efficiency you're going to get um, may be 98, 99%, but for the most part, chain drive systems are in that 94 to 95% um, efficiency. When you're designing, is it a lot more demanding to get like some of the like spur gears to mesh up perfectly compared to like a chain or a belt drive? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, um, building a transmission um, with spur gears, alignment to get the gears to interact e with each other uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, um, with, the, with the different spur gears that you could use, um, a difference of, of, I don't know, two or three thousandths of an inch, uh, two, a thousandth of an inch off, could determine whether or not your, your mesh will be 60% uh, or 90%. And obviously you, you can't get 100% mesh because your gears won't move. Um, and you'll jam, but as you go through, you want to maximize that efficiency and having the right pitch angle uh, and interaction between the gears is absolutely critical. You, your tolerances have to be very tight when you're designing a gear ratio, a gear system. Again, that one falls back to never try to over-design your capabilities. Never, never build something more complex than you can actually, uh, design something more complex that you can actually build. So always know your limits with that. Um, and uh, again, bevel gear is another system that you'll see very heavily used on swerve drive robots. Um, you'll see these bevel gears used. And again, the efficiency is a lot lower. 
uh, 90% 90 to 95%. Uh, um, and you can Google links and find links where they talk about the efficiency of different uh, spur gears and bevel gears uh, on the drive systems. So, and a third type besides uh, spur gears or belt or chain is, uh, you'll see this used often in first, as a matter of fact, a traditional component that we've had from the first kit of parts is the window motor, which is a very large worm gear. Uh, but notice the efficiency on worm gears, typically 40 to 70 percent efficient. So the worm gears are, are, are inherently inefficient. However, there are a lot of benefits that you can get from those worm gears. Um, you'll typically have um, less issues with backlash, um, which, is the, which is the load driving the motor backwards. Um, although there are some motors in FIRST that have anti-backlash pins um, and uh, some that are designed not to have that backlash. Uh, okay, we're going to gear back. Uh, I, I misspoke just a minute ago when I said back, um, backlash. Um, the, uh, it, it's back drive when we're talking about worm gears and, and the anti-back drive pins. Backlash is the actual interaction between the two gears. It's the amount of shift between the two gears while neither one of them are turning. So um, that backlash um, can be minimized by designing your transmission system properly. Um, another, another way to maximize efficiency um, or another way to transmit power, excuse me, is to look at planetary gears. Uh, again, you'll see these in the uh, gear motors from Andy Mark. You'll see these in some of the other uh, drill motors, DeWalt uh, XRPs. Um, you'll see these uh, planetary gear systems where you have a fixed ring gear that, uh, that is on the outside, then a star gear in the center, a sun gear in the center, and then the, uh, the transmission, the planetary gears that revolve around. Um, that's another way of transmitting power in a compact space. So uh, again, these are almost always spur gears that go around uh, a ring gear on the outside and spur gear in the center, or pinion in the center. Um, so uh, again, the gear ratios, they are multiplicative. So you can actually put two stages of gear reduction together and the output is multiplied, uh, either in speed or in torque or divided in, in the opposite case. So those gear systems are, uh, are calculated through based on the uh, diameters uh, or the teeth of the gears or the diameters of the pulley because we can talk about belt drive systems. So these pulleys or these diametrical sizes um, are what's important when you're calculating out your final ratios um, through your drive system. Um, I'm going to try and wrap this up pretty quickly here on the system design conditions. Um, as we look at it, um, some basic assumptions if we look at design conditions, uh, make an assumption that you're building a four-wheel drive with four motors, your weight is evenly distributed, and using all the spur gears, um, what, what, what could we do if we did this exercise? Um, what could we calculate out if we knew that the weight of the robot and we knew that the, this uh, weight transferred from the robot to the goal, um, could we calculate uh, based on some of the equations that I've used, uh, as we look at, could we calculate at the maximum tractive force? And would we be able to figure out if we knew um, this weight distribution, uh, this would be an exercise that you could go through and, and design um, your robot. And you want to make sure that you are maximizing your tractive force and you would go through and actually calculate that out. So we're going to skip this design, consider this design condition uh, or at least gloss over it really quickly that that torque um, that torque times the gear ratio times the efficiency is going to give you your output torque and then your friction, uh, your friction force times the, or equals the uh, output torque divided by your, um, your motor speed, that free speed. So you can go through and, and calculate out your gear ratio um, necessary to figure out that output speed that you want to get, that, that wheel speed, of the RPM, um, it, it's a way to figure that out, uh, figure out your tractive force, and you'd be able to come up with your gear ratio that would give you the best tractive force. Um, and then given that, given that gear ratio, you could go through and determine which motors you're going to use, and you would be able to figure out the maximum speed of your robot, again, looking for this drive system friction where you know that uh, hopefully in physics class you've learned that no system is perfect. No system has 100% efficiency. So you calculate with a fudge factor of about a 90% efficiency with drivetrain friction. Um, so as you do this, you'll come through and figure out your max velocity um, basically by running through the free speed of your motor um, times the diame diameter of your radius or diameter of your wheel 
which gives you the circumference of the wheel if you run that through, uh, times the uh, uh, time by the gear ratio in the bottom, you'll be able to figure out your velocity of your machine. So as you go through this whole process, uh, you would want to make sure that you're uh, calculating these numbers out before you build your drivetrain. Again, it seems like it takes a little extra and the, the, the impulse in first, the impulse that you have is to just grab the Mark base, start building it and say, here it is. Uh, I've got the Mark wheels on it, I've got this, and then you look at the playing surface and you thought, well, what's the coefficient of friction? What's it going to happen when we put it on this inclined plane? You really need to take the time to go through these calculations. Determine the gear ratios that will best play your game strategy. Um, and as we look at it, uh, if we plugged and chugged on the numbers that I was just uh, going through very, very quickly, um, looking at the kit transmission, um, weight, weight of the robot, notice that we've thrown in an extra few pounds and that's for the battery that's not accounted for in the first weight. Um, the, uh, as you go through each number that you're given and the constraints, plug it into the formula, you'll find out that this gear ratio um, from the kit comes down to about a 17, um, we could come out with a top speed that uh, our robot will go with a 130 pound robot based on four wheel drive from the kit bot. This 10 feet per second is generally your top speed and your max pushing force is going to be about 103 pounds. So you'll be able to push out with the kit bot frame and the kit bot just in its base form with with a 120 pound machine and a 10 pound battery or so, um, you're going to come up with about 104 pounds um, of pushing force and a top speed of 10 feet per second. So um, in first, the fields have been fairly consistent in size, uh, although I can't vouch for what it's going to be in the next year. Um, but as you do this, that's one of the considerations you need to know. And This is where a lot of teams stumble in the designs is, uh, should we just use what we're given in the kit of parts? Or should we go out and purchase transmission systems? Should we design gear, gear, uh, gear, our own geared transmission or shifting transmissions? Um, you really need to look at it and say, is it necessary? What advantage am I going to get? What's the, what's the effort impact uh, comparison that I'm going to get to design my own transmission system, to design my swerve drive system, to design just a four-wheel kit bot, uh, or using 1114's uh, kit bot on steroids? What modifications can you get effort versus impact to use um, as you go through this? And that's these last consider considerations as we, as we wrap up today. Um, reliability of your machine is absolutely critical. I meant, to, uh, I meant to put this in in the front half of the discussion. One of the first things that you need to design in your robot or decide on your robot is are you a team that is seeking the world championship robot and is that your goal or is your goal to develop an, an incredibly intricate engineering marvel that just wows everybody? It's often that the two, most often that the two are not compatible systems. So if you design the most incredible engineered robot that's got this really awesome swerve drive or this really awesome mechanism, you may not, you may find that that's not as compatible as old reliable um, first kit bot drive system. So as you think, you, you have to go through that evaluation. Uh, there's, there's merit for both. There's absolute merit for building a really complex drive system that's really awesome engineering, um, getting that inspiration. Uh, but there's also the teams that, that you make a decision, you say, doggone it, we want to bring home a trophy. And doing that, we're going to use a very simple, reliable system that we know works. It's tried, it's tested, and we don't have to guess. We can just use. And implementation is, is good. First, doesn't say which path is right. And I, I love that. You don't have to decide. But what you do need to do is in any first game, um, if you want to be a competitive team, you want to make sure that your drive system is simple. You want to make sure that, um, that you get it up and running as soon as possible. Um, in the first week, perhaps, uh, after you've evaluated the rules, you've deci decided on a game strategy, get that base up and running as quickly as possible so that you can practice with it. You want to be driving flawlessly in the first two weeks of the, of the build season. Um, you also want to keep that drive system very simple so that it is easy to maintain because as I mentioned before you get five minute you get a five minute timeout to take at the world championships in the finals match between finals match one and finals match two. If you wanted to be that team in that, in that situation and if you have something break you have that amount of time to fix it. And even if the other team is gracious enough to call that extra time out for you, um, you now only have 10 minutes and that's going to fly by. And if you don't have a machine that you can be a reliable machine that's simple, uh, you won't have that time to fix it. Um, 
the faster you get into driving a base around, the faster you can see the flaws uh, as you look at it. And you can say, you know what, I uh, didn't, didn't mean it to do that, and I want to make it fixed. So you have more time in the build season to actually correct any mistakes. Um, you have the ability to fine tune it. You want to put on some encoders. You want to make sure that you can track autonomously how far you've driven and what you've done with it. Um, you want to make sure that you have that testing time. So you want to make a reliable base that's simple, that plays the game. You want to get it running quickly so that you can test it out and start to find the design flaws and the design characteristics and what you need to do to improve those systems. Um, you want to strongly recommend, like I strongly recommend considering the fact that you need to assemble it and disassemble it in a lot of scenarios with low light, with high light, with whatever you have. You want to make sure that you can fix what's broken. Uh, uh, an effective drivetrain can be fixed in less, uh, a reliable drivetrain, an effective um, drivetrain can be fixed in less than five minutes. Um, so you want to make sure that you can swap out the motors. Uh, you want to be able to get to the gear systems. Uh, don't, uh, over, don't over constrain your system uh, such that you have to repair motors. The motors should last, but there have been cases where some of the motors um, are faulty or perhaps you, um, perhaps the users have, uh, have caused conditions that are, are failed conditions of the motors and you need to swap it out. So you want to make sure that you can get those changed quickly. Um, Make sure you use reliable fastening systems. Uh, don't weld uh, devices that need to be swapped out. If you weld them in place, great. You've got a great skill of being able to weld it. However, if you're in that tournament championship and you need to fix it and you have to cut a weld, you're not going to have access to that grinding tool. You're not going to be able to, to throw sparks in the middle of the competition field. So you want to make sure that, that it's uh, reparable. Um, so that, that fastening system, how you, how you tension chains, how you tension belts, those all have to be maintainable. And, and at, at absolutely all costs, support the, support the motor shafts appropriately and your output shafts and your drive system um, adequately. Avoid cantilevered systems. Um, they might look nice on a car where you don't have a, a, a shared load or a dual shear condition and, and a supported load uh, in, two, in two spots. A cantilevered wheel works great on a car, um, but on first robots, cantilevers always fail. Uh, on drive systems. So you want to make sure that you support the shafts appropriately with bearings or bushings on either side. Uh, reduce the friction, reduce, the, reduce, reduce that, um, that uh, maximize efficiency by reducing the drag forces that are on your drive system. Again, that'll help your current draw, it helps your robot sustain electrical, electrical systems, and also it makes your, uh, your robot more controllable. Um, so I think that's all I have today uh, with drive system fundamentals. Uh, a fabulous audience are there any questions uh, from you all about the fundamentals? I will provide this on the web, this, uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I stole from all those folks that I mentioned. Uh, I'll provide it for you for links. There's a lot of fabulous links through the first Kit of Parts website um, that talk about all the motor specs. They list them out for you. They've done a great job with that. But if you have questions specifically about any of these, I'll, I'll answer them at this time. What do you think? Yeah? Yay.